Whoa, that's hot. <laughs> hey guys, what's up? Eddie Alho here with KissAnalog.com. This guy's, this guy's toasty. The heat sink here gets pretty warm and then it actually starts spreading to the big heavy faceplate and the handles, it's, it's, it's pretty warm. I think that's about as hot as I want to run it in the class A slash AB. And uh, I'm setting up the bias. I want to show you guys how I set up the bias, okay? Now, here's the thing. I want to talk about class A slash AB and really what it's all about. And I mean, maybe you guys have a great understanding, but I just want to give you my view on this thing, or, or at least maybe a different view. So let's look at my whiteboard. All right, guys, in this video, what I want to do is do a deep dive in biasing an amplifier. And I want to kind of go over, you know, the different types of amplifiers and why we bias them and what it's all about. So hope you stay tuned for this long video. <laughs> All right, guys, so I've got a little schematic here, and it's just a real simple amplifier. And I just kind of want to walk through how you'd bias this to, to make it work. <laughs> this is our output that would go to our speaker. Or, in this case, we're going to eventually put an 8 ohm load there. But right now, nothing's connected, okay? So, what we'd want is, we would want to swing the voltage up and down. And if we had a single voltage drill and a ground, we would want to place this in the middle of this voltage. So let's say that this is going to be 8 ohm speaker, and we're going to put 8 watts into it. Just make math easy, uh, just so we can talk about the understanding of how this, you know, things work. So 1 amp into 8 ohms would be our uh, 8 watts, okay? I squared R, so 1 squared times 8. All right. So we're going to have 8 volts here too, right? We'll have 8 volts. So let's say this is going to be 16 volts. Let's just start there. So we bias this right in the middle, make that 8 volts. Well, that's why I got 8 ohms here, because uh, let's say we're going to bias this thing with 1 amp. We're going to put 1 amp current through here, just right here. So I've got this curve. Here's current, voltage. We're going to set the bias current at 1 amp. So 1 amp going through this when no music, nothing's happening. Okay? So 1 amp through this, 8 volts, 8 volts, 16 volts. Okay? Uh, so we're going to start off 16 volts here, and we're going to say we're going to put this the bias voltage right here at 8 volts, and we'll have bias current of, you know, 1 amp. <laughs> All right, so we set a voltage here, a bias voltage. We put something here just to kind of turn this thing on to get that thing running at one amp. And then we have some music coming in after that that makes this go down to close to ground to close to 16 volts. Let's see how that would work. Okay, so... This guy is operating at one amp. He's nice and warm. He's on. We don't have to worry about um, turning on this base emitter because he's already on. He's just sitting there idling with one amp going through him. So this guy, if you think about it, he has to be equal to eight ohms too. So his output impedance of this guy is eight ohms. The total output impedance would be the two of those in parallel would be like four ohms. So we're not going to have a very good dampening factor. You know, 8 ohms and the impedance here is just half of it. So that's not a great thing. But we're just doing these numbers to make math easy. Okay. So 1 amp going through here. This guy looks like 8 ohms. This is an 8 ohm resistor just to make everything work out. All right. So then this guy, when music... Um, starts going negative, then he turns on to pull this down to ground, to, you know, negative, okay? So, um, 
One way to uh, analyze circuits is just to look at the extremes and then kind of figure out what happens in between. So we say, okay, when this is fully on, when the signal really wants to pull this down to ground, we just put a big signal there, we pull it down. So he goes down to ground. So we got, uh, now to do that, he was one amp and we had 16 volts up here. So now the 16 volts has to be dropped across here. So we have to have two amps. So he goes from one amp to two amps. So he swings to two amps. And that makes our voltage, this voltage drop down to zero, okay? So he swings down to zero. So the thing that happens in between is just a linear thing. The more current you put, the, you know, this thing goes from eight to six to four to two ohms down to zero ohms. Now, we're, we're saying ideally he would go to zero. Really, there'd be a little voltage drop across here. So he wouldn't quite get there. So it wouldn't be quite be two times the current. But we're just, to make math easy, we're saying that that's what's going to happen. But to understand that it doesn't quite do it, then we go, okay, we did the extreme ideal case. Now we kind of back away from that and say, well, but really, it's not going to quite get there and blah, blah, you know. We kind of work through it, okay? Now, he swings, the signal goes back to, to, to zero over here, okay? So he comes up here to zero. So now, um, we're gonna, he's going to swing high. So how does he swing high? This guy can't change. He's a resistor. So this guy basically has to go real big in ohms. He has to kind of turn off. And as he turns off, this gets pulled up to voltage, right? He gets pulled up. So, but he's not going to turn off completely because we need current for our load. So, and we're always going to have at least IV, right? So, let's say he goes equivalent to 80 ohms, 10 times this. Engineering math, right? 10 times gives you about 90% accuracy in this case, let's say. So... We're going to say he goes to about 80 ohms, equivalency to 80 ohms, and this swings up. Well, if this wasn't connected to anything, well, then the current would drop off. It would go from IB down to here, and the voltage would go up. So this curve, this load curve, would represent what the actual thing would do without a load. Okay? So now let's add our load. Okay? So if we put a load in here, when this guy went negative, he would, you know, take this voltage down to zero. There wouldn't be any current for this. So that doesn't quite work, right? This amplifier is not going to really work. So now you can kind of see why we need, we usually use plus and minus voltages because you can't get current to go through your load when this guy swings down low. And also when this guy swings high when this guy goes to 80 ohms and he goes up then that current one amp through these that's eight and eight so that that kind of works you know but the voltage here is not going to go up to 16 so that doesn't work so you really need a higher voltage so this this thing doesn't work right so this is kind of like a tube amp you know just a single tube out here but really what you would do is you go well okay we're gonna put a transformer here we're gonna we're gonna take the signal off of this what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a primary winding here let's say it's equal to 8 ohms and then secondary winding over here this is where we take our 8 ohms okay so now he's not tight here he's tight over here on a transformer Oh, wow. Circuit changed. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh, okay. Well, so I'm just, you know, we're just kind of talking and talking about ideas and that. We're, this isn't like an exact circuit. This is super simplified stuff, but it gives us an idea of how these things, you know, why we operate class A, class AB, why we do the things we do. So now here we go. Imagine this. The reason we use a transformer is to 
break the DC connection. So this is AC only over here. So now we put a load over here and it works. So now we can put an 8 ohm load and it's going to be, this is going to be an AC signal. So now we can go, you know, AC negative, AC positive. But the thing is, is if we put, you know, 16 volts here, that's going to be a lot of current that we have to put in here to uh, swing this transformer. I, it just, the turns ratio, the, it's going to heat up this primary winding because we just don't, you have to add a lot of turns, but then the wire has to be big because there's a lot of current. It's, so what if we make this voltage like say three, 400 volts? So we make the voltage high. Now, to get the same amount of power, uh, say it was 800 volts, just make the math easy again. The current going through here doesn't have to be that much because we're going to step it down from this to this. So if the voltage is stepping down, say, 10 times, the current steps up 10 times. So the current over here is 10 times less. So maybe it's 100 times. Maybe we have 100 more turns. But you kind of get where I'm going. So with a high voltage, you don't have to put very much current. And then you can do this. Well, our voltage, let's say we had... Uh, 800 volts. We'd have 400 volts here. Uh, you know, with tube amps and that, if this was a tube, it'd probably be three or 400 volts. But let's just say, you know, we're doing this with the transistor and we put 400 volts here. So we got 400 volts here, 400 volts across this guy. Now this guy, the voltage is going to go, it's going to go from double the current to almost off to double the current to almost off so he's going to swing up and down swing up so he's class a when he's not doing anything he's taking half the current so the advantage of that is he's always operating in a linear region hopefully you set him right in the middle of a linear region that he wants to work in and then he just swings up and down that linear region and he runs hot but hey he doesn't have to be turned on and off He's always on, he gets turned on more on, and then almost off. We're not almost, but you don't go so close to where he becomes nonlinear, you, you, you know. So, you're, and you're not really maxing him out either. So you're kind of swinging in here, and this AC waveform transfers out here. So, I mean, with tubes, they did something like this. They had output transformers to couple it, and, and it was kind of a mess. Um, it wasn't easy, but they did what they had to do because they uh, were using tubes. <laughs> Along came the transistor, and they're like, let's get rid of that design. But then they went through iterations and come up with all kinds of other stuff, and now we have FETs. Now we're going to have GAN FETs. We already have GAN FETs. But anyway, with the amplifiers... GANFETs really show their beauty in Class D. In Class A, A, B, FETs and BJTs are still kind of the king there. But So, with only a single voltage rail, you could do something like this, right? Now, if it's lower power, like in a preamp, you might put a capacitor here and capacitively couple your load to it. So, it breaks the DC connection. Now, your load is, uh, is you know... It's galvanically disconnected, galvanically isolated from this side because it has a capacitor. And this guy's galvanically isolated because he's got an inductor. So you can't put an ohmmeter from the other side of the capacitor and this side and, and see ohms, right? It's capacitor charge up and open, and you can't see anything through the transformer. So with a single supply rail, that'd be one way to do it. Uh, the other way you would be to do it is to have an artificial ground, like a virtual ground. And so you're swinging up and down from that. But anyway, just kind of getting you, your feet wet. And, and, you know, if you're not familiar with this, trying to show a simplified version of why things became Class A. We want a transistor to operate in its linear region. And I'm going to show you some data sheets to show you that and a schematic. Uh, and we're gonna look at the class A stuff. Okay, I mean, and we'll look at this uh, amplifier schematic and it's the transistor they used in that and see what we need to do to make it operate linearly, okay? 
Hey, I got an idea. Why don't we use a plus minus voltage rail? Then we don't need that transformer. We can swing around. Whoops, I forgot something. Oh, no I didn't, it's there. <laughs> anyway, all right guys, so we're just kinda, you know, taking steps towards where we're getting. We're gonna get to something more like this output. So what I have here is a plus eight volts, minus eight volts, just two batteries, two whatever in series. The center point is the ground, that's this. Minus V is tied here, plus V is tied there. Okay, just wanted to show the voltage rails so you could see that. And um, all right, so, and by the way, they call them voltage rails because, you know, it usually drawn across here and all the circuitry between the output and the input is tied off of that. So it's a voltage rail. You know, it's just a rail that you take voltages off. Just kind of throwing it out there for those that maybe haven't heard heard or understood why they call them that okay so now what we do same thing I have a NPN NPN diode points at the N so it's P and P so I got two different transistors and these transistors we're going to try to match them the characteristics similarly usually P and P transistors or or P channel FETs are take more semiconductor material take more dye to make them as good as an NPN. I mean, as good as far as the same characteristics. So usually that pellet, that silicon dye inside is larger, okay? So when they match a pair, it's because they purposely, you know, they took one of these, didn't make it as big as it could have been because they wanted it first make this and then match this to this one that's probably that's my guess how they did it all right because otherwise if you made this and then tried to make this as good as that you're like oh geez how do i get there because <laughs> you know you're given a certain package like in this case we're going to say a to3 a metal package one of those round guys um kind of oval with the you know ears that you bolt down so all right so let's just get to the circuit here uh speakers out here Nothing's tied there yet. We're going to set the bias. We're going to turn this thing on. We're going to set up one amp right here in the middle. So we're going to run one amp through here. We got eight volts, eight volts. So this transistor is going to look like eight ohms, let's just say. And this guy's going to look like eight ohms. So that way, one amp, we got eight volts, eight volts, drop. Okay. So there we go. This guy right here is in the center, zero. So it's equal to that because. It's essentially the same thing, even though it's not connected yet. <laughs> um, all right, so the bias is set. And what we did is, well, we'd probably, I didn't really show it, but we'd have some, probably say a resistor to the plus rail, and resistor down here to the plus rail, okay? So that's how we would do it. But I want to take a step back further and say, we don't have that. This is going to be a class AB. He's not going to be biased this way. Okay, we're going to start off that way because I don't have the bias circuit shown. So there's no bias. He's just, hey, he's super efficient. When there's no signal, these guys are off. So there's nothing going on. This, everything's off. No current. This is zero. There we go. Now a music signal comes. A sine wave. This is the input. This is the output. Okay. And... So the input signal comes up, as it comes up, it turns on this transistor, but not immediately. There's a little dead time. I tried to show a flat spot there. A little dead time, and then it starts to rise. It starts to turn on, it pulls this guy up, okay? And then as it starts to drop, as soon as it gets around 0.7 volts, it just drops off. So then it's flat until this guy gets low enough, so these 0.7 volts below this point, and then um, he, he starts to turn on, and it goes negative. And then the same thing happens. As the signal starts going positive back up to ground, then 0.7 volts away, he turns off. So it goes flat. Nothing's happening until it gets 0.7 volts above, and then he turns on. And then this, so that's class B.
that's no good. No bueno. We don't like that. So, okay, so what do we do? We got to bias this thing on, right? We got to make this thing so that these guys are right there turned on, like almost turned on or whatever, uh, so that we don't have to get past that 0.7. If we had 1.4 volts across here, then both these guys would be right, right there. Let's say just below. Let's say it takes 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 1.4. Let's say we go 1.3, just below that. So they're not on yet. And then there's just a teeny bit of crossover. Eh, we, don't, we still don't like it. So maybe we make it 1.4, so they are on. So we got a little bit of current going through them, they're on. Well, that's barely class AB, no crossover distortion. Well, not that's not exactly right because you don't have the flat spot, but you still get kind of a, a weird wiggle. And that's because the gain of these guys, it takes a little bit of current to get these really idling. It's kind of like your car. You you have to, you know, they set an idle current on that. So this guy and this guy are kind of running, right? So then as the signal goes up, they're idling. It's like putting the gas pedal on, you're going. So that's what you want. You want a nice linear rise. So even if you got rid of the crossover distortion, the flat part, you don't want it to have this weird wiggle because the gain, you know, as this guy's increasing, he's not getting this exactly, he's not following it. Maybe there's a gain of 20 between this guy and this guy. Well, he's not, maybe he starts off a gain of five, 10, 15, and then he's finally up to 20, so the waveform's kind of weird. So class A, B operation is technically when you get rid of the little shelf thing, but to get a nice linear operation, people still said class A, B. but so I'm kind of wondering, is is that really just a hot class AB? Like, is it really just AB, but biased more? Because once you get to that linear re region where they're both starting, maybe they're in the beginning of their linear region instead of halfway in their linear region, right? All right, so now I've got a new circuit on here. Got a little bias network. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to bias this thing so we're not in that class AB, no crossover distortion. And how we're going to do that is we're going to put a little voltage here, which will turn on both these transistors. So when no music's playing or anything like that, when we're just sitting here idle, that we actually have some idle current, some bias current. So what we'll do is we'll set the voltage here Turning on both these transistors, there'll be some current going down, just like in that class A. So we have just constant current running, you know, and uh, that way we don't get any crossover distortion. And the way that works is that if you have some voltage here, both transistors are turned on and current running through all the time, then you have a bias current right here, I bias right here, okay? And um, again, plus V, minus V, just like in the other circuits. 8 ohm load, 8 watts is what we're going to kind of pretend we're going for, okay? And so in this situation, what we have is we'll put enough voltage here so that we can get one amp going through here. So be one amp bias current. It's just idling. It's like your car just sitting there idling away. So... Unlike that class B situation where you had to start, stop, you know, this transistor would have to have enough voltage to turn on that base emitter to turn on. So meanwhile, the output voltage is just flat and then all of a sudden it comes above 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts, it starts to rise. And then also there's a little curvature there too, by the way, and then it goes up and so on. But then as it comes down at 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts, it turns off. There's a little bit of a curve there. There's that knee. They call it the knee. And then this transistor turns on after it reaches 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts above this. And so there's that flat spot in AB. Well, in this one, because these are guys are both on, as soon as we get a signal, 
then we start, if it's positive, we just start going positive. If it's negative, we start going negative right away because they're already on. We don't have to uh, bias these things because they're already pre-biased with this uh, bias network, okay? Now, what I did is I just showed two diodes here just to, as an example, that if we have 0.7 here, 0.7 here, putting two diodes between those bases puts 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 1.4, which would turn those on. So it'd make a real easy way just to turn those on. Now, the other thing, we're gonna get back to that, but the other thing I'm showing is, is these resistors. And the reason we'd have those resistors in there is, uh, one of the big reasons is we'd parallel transistors. And when you parallel transistors, they don't share very well. As one transistor starts to get warmer, then it's it doesn't take as much voltage to turn it on. It starts getting more current through the base emitter, which puts more current through the collector to emitter. But the voltage to turn this on, well, it's all the way across here, right? But basically, if we're getting more voltage across this resistor, it's less voltage that can be across the base emitter. So that would help turn it off. So we'd get, as more current flows, less and less voltage would be applied. For instance, if there's enough current flowing where you had 1.4 just across these two resistors, there wouldn't be one point, you wouldn't have the 1.4 to drop across these guys. So, you know, before that could happen, as soon as the current started rising, there'd be some balancing act going on where, you know, you could only get so much current. But really what happens in a parallel configuration where you have parallel transistors, they don't want to share perfectly. As soon as one starts taking too much current, that situation, the local feedback, it's local feedback to this transistor, it's negative feedback because it negatively reacts to what's happening. So it says, it tells this transistor, whoa, slow down a little bit. The other transistor says, okay, thank you, I'll take over. And then they kind of self-balance each other. They kind of, you know, parallel better that way. So that's why BJT amplifiers, they always use uh, emitter resistors, they call them. All right. Now with MOSFETs, you don't really have to do that. They share much better. Uh, I think some people still do that for other reasons, but yeah, you really don't have to. BJTs you do, okay? Now, really, you might only use one diode because what if this is 0 0.7, 0 0.7? What if this is 0.65 and 0.65? You know, you don't want to... The threshold of turning them on would be like, well, which diodes have the higher voltage? So you'd probably only use one diode. And why would you use diodes at all? Well, the reason why is because, like I said, is, is they warm up, they change how much bias they need. So you'd really take this diode and put it on the heat sink. And actually, it, it would be a transistor. So the diode junction here, like this is a, remember the diode points at the N, right? So it's N, P, N. So it's P, N here. It's a PN junction diode, but there's actually one here too. So that's why it's called a NPN, okay? And diode points at the N junction, right? So it's P and P. So um, in this configuration, we would we would really use a transistor over here. I just simplified it by showing diodes, and there'd just be one transistor. The PN junction would be mounted on, like in this case, on this design we have here, this class A, uh, we have a transistor here and it's driving this and I'll explain that in a moment. The reason why you'd use more complex circuitry instead of just something simple like this. But the reason you use that PN junction is so as the bias needs change over here, uh, the transistor, the diode here, uh, tracks what's going on here. So the bias network kind of tracks what's going on what's necessary over here to keep your your bias set up correctly, okay? All right, so the reason you don't use just diodes and a resistor over here to set the voltage, like you'd use a potentiometer here to set this resistance from, 
whatever, 1K to 5K, something like that. You'd set it here to set a certain voltage here to get the one amp going through here. And it's convenient that you have these resistors here, like in the case of this board here, there's two traces that come off of one of, there's actually two transistors in parallel. One of the transistors has two traces coming off of the 0.22 ohm resistor. And that's so you can measure the voltage so that you know how much current's going through. So if you have 220 millivolts, you'd have one amp going through, okay? So, so it makes it convenient for that, as well as helping the transistor share. <laughs> now, the value, you come up with the value relative to some kind of current value. You know, you, you want some small value here, 0 0.1, 0 0.22, 0 0.33, something like that. If it's a real low power amplifier, you wouldn't need parallel transistors, so you probably wouldn't need one. But when you do use them, it just turns out that uh, 0.22 is a good value, 0.33s some people use, but you get more power loss across it, right? So it has to be a pretty good size resistor, which we have on this board, okay? So now this configuration is a, like a push-pull. So it's this transistor up here replaced that original class A 8 ohm resistor. If we go back and think about that circuit, we had an 8 ohm resistor here, and we had an NPN here. NPN, not a PNP. And we'd drive this guy on, and this 8 ohm was a slave. Well, you could use that dynamic resistance by putting a transistor up here that had a gain that was kind of controlled by this guy, and that would be a slave to this master. But in this case, in this configuration where the emitters point to each other, it makes the bias network really simple, and it, and it creates what we call the push-pull circuit. So they're both, they both are working together, you know, and versus master slave thing, which, you know, in that case, you're kind of working together too. But in this case, these guys are uh, pull, pulling this point up to plus V, my, down to minus V. So makes it nice. Now, when you analyze these circuits, again, you know, it's always makes it a little bit easier to look at the extreme. So the first extreme case, you would set this thing here to get enough voltage here, say 1.4, somewhere around there, where you get, uh, where you measure one amp going through here, okay? So that's this condition here. Zero volts here, so it's essentially ground right here. It's zero, zero, so nothing's happening at the load. It's just sitting there waiting for you to play some music. Okay, so then you turn on the signal, you start playing some music. Let's say you just put that one kilohertz sine wave test signal, okay? So as soon as you start doing that and it starts going plus, let's look at the extreme, the top of the waveform. So you go to the top of the waveform and this, let's say this transistor's turned on fully, okay? Ideally, you'd have zero volts here, zero volts across here. This guy here would go to eight volts and you'd have, you know, eight volts across your eight ohms would be your eight watts, okay? So that's the ideal situation. And in that case, you have one amp going through your eight ohms, which would give you your eight volts across it, your eight watts, and you'd have one amp going through this way. So the current would start at your bias and go up to two amps, up to two times your bias current, okay? In this situation, this ideal situation. Reality sets in and you realize, oh shoot, this transistor, even when I try to turn it on fully, there's still volt drop across that. Oh, and also one amp going through this is 220 millivolts. So I got one volt, I got 1.22 volts drop across here. So, wow, I actually only get, what is that, 6.78, 6 6.78 volts here. So, like, wow, I can't quite get my 8 watts. So, you'd actually have to maybe make this 10 volts or something like that. So, you need some voltage headroom, okay, so that you can get your 8 watts. So, that's a real life situation, and that's what I'm dealing with back here. To get the power I want, I have a pretty high voltage rail. So we're gonna look at the specs on this transistor that we have in this class A back here. And um, I do have 0.22, so that is real resistance value. And I do have two 
parallel FETs on e or sorry, BJTs, bipolar transistors on each one. So I've got, uh, you know, we'll look at that schematic real quick. But yeah, so I'll show you this setup here and I'll show you the bias network just to remind you what that schematic looks like. My last video on this, um, where I repaired it. First I did some troubleshooting, then I repaired it. And now we're gonna set the bias. Uh, I showed the schematics there too, so you can watch those videos. Um, so anyway, now the signal goes from plus down to minus. Let's go to the extreme end. And ex on the extreme end, this would be fully on. And we'd say, oh, that's zero volts, this is zero volts, this goes down to minus eight. So same situation we go up to two times the bias current. Again, we can't quite do that. So with, with eight volts, we can't quite do that. So we're not gonna quite go all the way to two times the bias current. But in reality, we would set these rails to like 10 volts to get eight volts out here, at least 10 volts, right? We're gonna look at the, the, the voltage drop on these guys to see what seems reasonable. And also we want more than eight watts. But anyway, just as the example goes, we would probably need 10 volts here to get our eight watts out, okay? All right, so is that one amp? Is, is that what we want to set this to? Okay, that's the other question. We have to have a turn on so they're both on, they're both idling, so we're in that class AB scenario. But how much current do we need? Like. What's class A? Like, how much current do we need to get to get to class A? Well, let's not, you know, worry. Let's not worry too much about um, class A, class AB, or what the definition of those are. Which, actually, in these newer circuits, like this push-pull topology, it can kind of become a question mark. Actually, like, like I'm thinking to myself, like, wow, geez, how do I design this to be? Class A. Well, um, here's the thing: is they're both on, so there's no crossword distortion. So we're past that. We got the AB. So what's the value of a Class A? Hmm. Let's think about this. These transistors, the way they work is, as you increase the voltage, as you start to increase voltage this way, let's say, at a certain point, 0.6 volts, let's say, 0.7 volts. I'm just saying that it's around there. We're going to look at the data sheets and see what that is. The curve's going to start going up. It's going to start, the current's going to start rising. And as you increase the voltage more and more, you know, and really it's going to clamp itself to a certain voltage. But as you push more current through here, it's going to go up. Now, what really, the way these guys really work is bipolar transistors are current driven. Yeah, they need voltage. You have to put so much voltage on there to turn them on. But after that, they're kind of clamped and they're going to just start accepting more and more current. And the more and more current that goes through the base to emitter, it's like uh, turning on the faucet more and more, you get voltage or current going through collector to emitter down this way. That's how you turn it on. It's not like an on off switch, like you reach that 0 0.6, 0 0.7 volts and it's on, right? It, it's on but it depends on how much current you put through here which you know which controls how much current goes to the transistor so let's just say that we have a gain of 100 so hfe some people call it that or or beta but you have a gain right and so if it's gain of 100 you put 10 milliamps into the base you'll get 10 times 100 is 1,000 milliamps. You get one amp going through here. Cool. Now, here's the thing. As that transistor starts to turn on, let's say at 10 milliamps, you got one amp. You're on that curve at one amp. Now you put 15 milliamps or 20 milliamps. It's going to be kind of linear. It's going to be a gain of 100. It's, so that's linear, right? It's just whatever it is multiplied by 100. But at a certain point, this thing totally saturates. It's on as much as it can. The NPN material in there, the PNP material, whatever it is, it's it's totally saturated. It's, it's pushing as much current as it can. So the more current you put in, you're not going to get more current through it. So 
that curve is only linear through a certain range. Otherwise, it, it kind of breaks at the top end. It kind of says, oh, I can't do that anymore. You know, it kind of tops off and says, oh, I can't do any more current. You're putting more base current in, but it's just kind of flatlining, okay? And then when it first starts off, it's flatlining because there's like no current. But as soon as it turns on, there's that elbow. And then there's really kind of like another elbow up here. But in between there, it is kind of linear, okay? Not perfectly linear, but it it's pretty close to linear. So that's the area that we want to operate in, all right? So we're going to look at those curves, and we're going to see how much current we need to be in the, at the beginning of that linear. Now, for me, what I would think, we got to think about tolerances between transistors and temperature, how that changes, and other factors. So what we want to do is we want to get up into the beginning of that linear region. So as we push more current where we're pressing that amp, we want to be able to operate through that range of that linear range. So to me, that's class A. Well, I'd like to know what you guys think. Like, where do you like to bias them? How do you like to decide on that bias current on a push-pull topology? Yeah, i like to hear your feedback on that, okay? Now, let me get back to the gain. Gain of 100. That's a little unrealistic for power transistors. Power transistors, there's signal transistors that have gains of 300, 400, no problem. Power transistors, so when I call it signal transistors, I'm talking like they're driving like an amp, maybe two or something like that, or less, 600 milliamps. Power transistors are you know watts that's when you're starting to really drive stuff so when you start getting into these higher power transistors the gain's going to be like let's say only 25 instead of 100 we'll look at the gain of this guy again we'll look at the data sheet so let's say the gain is 25 just for a speaking point that'd be four times less than the 100 so that means like the current 10 milliamps would be four times higher so we'd have to have 40 milliamps going through here that's why this bias network here doesn't really work because we want to be able to feed enough current through here without having big, you know, heavy duty pots and big heavy duty diodes that can handle that kind of current that's going to be circling through here. So we're going to put a transistor here that can handle that, no problem. And then we'll bias that transistor to <laughs> set the voltage between its collector and emitter. And that way, we have an active device, just like we switched out here. It just helps this situation where now we don't heat up resistors and diodes and that kind of thing. We can use a transistor, okay? So again, I'll, show, I'll point that out in the schematic again. And I think you're going to become, with all these videos, you're becoming more and more familiar with how this Class A schematic works, how it works, and uh, the design of it, right? So saving the bias. What we're going to do is we're going to go see where that linear region is. We're going to look at the uh, uh, the current, you know, that kind of stuff, just to kind of see where we're set. And, you know, the other important factor in picking out a transistor is you want to make sure it can handle the voltage that you're going to put here. I'm putting, uh, I'm putting around 35 volts. So, you know, we want probably, it'd be nice to have a 2x factor, like a 70 volt transistor. That'd be nice. Um, so let's just go look at the voltage rating, the current rating, all that stuff. So we're really shooting for 20 watts here and in the 8 ohms. And in the 4 ohms, I like to be 40 watts. I like to be double that because power should be linear too, right? Uh, those amps that say they're 1 power at 8 ohms, and they don't double it four ohms. See, that's where the amp's not really that stiff. It's not really that strong. It's kind of a weak amp. You're kind of you kind of getting the benefit of the doubt just to say you can say a bigger number at eight ohms because unless you have a speaker that is fixed eight ohms, then you know maybe you just go buy an amp that's rated for eight ohm load, but. A lot of us know that, you know, that, um, and I, and I, honestly, I haven't even looked at the latest drivers, but from what I've heard is six ohms is becoming more of an, a nominal, and there's four ohms are common too, but 
regardless of what they're rated, they'll vary across frequencies and stuff. So as they're varying, you don't want your power level to be changing. You want a linear power. You want the amplifier to be power enough to drive the thing all the way through, right? So if it's rated for double the power at four ohms, to me, that, and I think if you look at the more powerful amps, the ones made by some of the more expensive vendors, I think they rate them more like that. So, which I think is more honest. So, and which means, you know, they're, anyway, they're not, it's not specsmanship. They're actually specking the amp for what it can do because the power should be linear across the ohms and all that. And they should just give a range. Hey, this is good for, our, you know, 16 to 2 ohms or something like that. But anyway, so I think we kind of covered that, and we're going to go look at data sheets, and we'll come back. All right? Let's do it. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to look at the data sheets. I'm going to show you uh, the curves and how they're kind of linear through certain parts of the curves. And even if you don't fully understand what the curve is showing you, you can kind of see this, this you know, parts that's a little bit, some curves are going to be coming down, some curves are going to be going up, but at the ends of the curve, especially the high currents, they take these, you know, steep turns. Now, also pay attention at the lower currents, around 0.2 amps or up, things are starting to turn on and transistors are starting to get biased. So let's go look at those data sheets. All right, guys. I got the data sheets for the NPN, the 15024MJ15024, and the PNP right here, MJ15025. Now, these transistors are matching. They're designed to work together, like in amplifiers and so on. So, like up here, high power audio, disc head positions, other linear applications. And that's what we want is a linear application, right? So these are the TO3 cans, otherwise known to Motorola as a TO-204 AA style one, case one. Motorola, well, now they're called on, but anyway, they, they, they always had their own TO and case size, style size nap, but this is well known as a TO3 can. All right, so what I want to show you that there's two things. I want to point out some of the specs, but also I want to show you how well the PNP here, or sorry, this is the NPN. What I want to do is show you how well these tables match, okay? So what they say is uh, absolute max 250 volts or 200, depending on which transistor, okay? The main thing to understand about these maximum rating tables is these things are maximums by themselves. Um, like two things don't get maxed out together. It just kind of says, hey, this is a maximum voltage you could have if you had, if the other things fell in place, or this is a maximum current you could have if the other things fell in place. Like if you could keep the temperature down, you could get that maximum uh, current through there. So that's what all this stuff is kind of saying. Important things are that when you look at the maximums, you go, wow, it's capable of this, you know, 250 watts. Wow, okay, that's good. But really, this number down here, 0 0.7 degrees C per watt, that's a number that's really important. That's your resistance from uh, for your temperature from the junction to the case. So let's just say you had 100 watts that you're dissipating in this can. 100 times that means that it'd be 70 degrees C higher on the junction than on the case. So if the case, if you could keep it 20C or 25C, something like that, let's say you kept it 25C, your junction would be 70 plus a 25, so it'd be 95 degrees C on your junction, and your junction can only get 200C. So if you can keep the thing cool, you can put a lot of current, a lot of power across it, but that's the trick, right? Okay, so I'm going to jump back to the NPN and just show you. There's 0.7 again. Okay, now let's go down to this table. Now this table, uh, the 
this column here is going to be minimum and maximum, so min max, okay? And this column to the left kind of shows you the what we're talking about, like voltage collector to emitter, 200, 250. And then if the units, if you want to look at microamps or amps, that kind of thing. So sometimes I just go down and look at units to find what I'm looking for, or I'm looking down here, like HFE. And so here's the gain. This is DC current gain. It's 15 and maximum 60, okay? And that's with eight amps going through it and four volts across the collector's emitter. So that's a lot of current. We're gonna see that below, like it can go to 16, but then look, the gain's all the way down to five. Okay, voltage based emitter on 2.2, that's max. That's what these maximum conditions, if you're trying to get eight amps through it and so on. So right here, this guy here, current gain, uh, this is a bandwidth product, okay? This is four megahertz. So it's very fast, plenty fast for what we're doing, right? But that can change depending on how much current and voltage and all that kind of stuff you're forcing on it. So. Let's just look at this curve right here. Safe operating area curve, very important curve. If I have 35 volts on a transistor, I'm here's 30 right here. So I'm between 30 and 40. And if I come up here, that hits curve here. That is, okay, so 20's down here. So 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. You know, it's something like eight amps. So you know, that's the max I can get out of it uh, with that kind of voltage on it, right? So if I'm, let's say right here to the left, where I'm pointing at one amp, if this is where I'm setting the bias current, you know, to uh, uh, set up the class A operation, if that's what I was going to do, I'd come over here, I'm within the safe operating area. I'm right about here. I can swing up and down. As long as I stand here, I shouldn't blow up the transistor. If I can keep it cool, that's what I mean. All those things have to work together. All right, so now we come down here and uh, this cur curve here on the right, one on the left, just quickly, the capacitance. Yeah, that's important. You got to charge, discharge capacitances, right? Okay, but we're not going to worry about that right now because that's not going to be a big problem when you're doing linear operations. Over here on the right, if we we're switching on and off, that'd be more important, okay? But the curve here on the right, collector current across the bottom, and then gain bandwidth product up here at the top. The part that's important of this curve is showing the gain bandwidth product is, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty linear, right? And then it starts to drop off about one amp, and then, between one and five, it's pretty linear, right? And then it starts to curve off again. So, right, you know, this is linear straight, and this is kind of linear as you're going down. So, anyway, it just kind of shows that after you get past point, you know, five amps, things start to change again, you know? So you're going through three different regions. So if you can operate in this region, that's good. Your current gain bandwidth product is linear between here. That's kind of why that, you know, short story, that's what that points out. Over here, this is maybe something that makes more sense. HFE, this is our DC current gains, right? And this is collector current. So if you look at this, it's, it's pretty flat, right? This is the for 25C. The line above is 100 C at the junction. So we're going to be operating somewhere in between there. So that looks pretty good. As you get hotter, it's, it's not as flat, right? It's more curvy, but it's still not too bad. We're going to be somewhere in between there. And, and it looks pretty good out to, say, 4 amps. And around 4 to 5 amps, it's starting to take a dive. So again... One of those things you kind of look at to see, like, okay, where, where do things start going in the toilet? Okay, the curves over here on the right are, again, kind of a more of a complex curve arrangement that they have going on. Uh, yeah, you have to sit here and study this to really 
look at it, to, but I'll just kind of go over it and explain it in a simple way, okay? The curve, I mean, the axis going up is volts, okay? Just voltage. What I would like to see is voltage based emitter, and then see these two curves by themselves, and then these two curves by themselves, but they put them on the same graph, so just ignore the bottom two curves and look at these top two curves for now. What it shows you is the voltage from base to emitter, okay, when the collector to emitter has, say, four volts, okay? So, you know, like I say, everything depends on something else. So that's, they're, they're giving you that as the dependence. And it, this is a 25C and this is a 100C. So we're, again, we're somewhere in between these two things. So if we're from 0.7 volts, that's, at 25C. Now, here's another important thing. The graph on the left, you, maybe you noticed that. Um, as it got hotter, the gain went up. And so, you know, as the gain goes up, you need less current at the base to drive it. If you still have the same current, you're getting more and more current. So that's that thermal runway. Over here on the right, kind of same thing. 25C on top, 100C on bottom. So 100C, you don't need as much voltage to turn it on. So, yeah, so that these two things are working towards thermal runaway. That's why we have uh, the circuit design so that it doesn't do that. Okay, so right through here, up to about, what, 4 amps, 5 amps, it looks pretty good, right? Then after that, it starts taking off. So again... We want to operate down in here, maybe, you know, up to three amps or four amps per transistor. Okay. Now the two curves on the bottom, what they show you is this is a collector emitter saturation. Okay. So it's, you know, 0.1 volts, let's say, and 25C and 100C again, and they're really close together. So they operate much closer across temperature. Now, this is IC divided by IB equals 10. So this is when your gain is 10. So let's just take a point here just to give you an example of how to calculate that. This is one amp um, collector current across the bottom. Okay, so one amp collector current. Put that in that formula. One amp divided by IB is equal to 10. So that means that I, you know, if you cross multiply, IC divided by 10 would be equals to IB. So 100 milliamps of base current would give you one amp um, of collector current in this case. So that's what they're showing you for this example, okay? But what it shows you in general is to about four to five amps, it's staying pretty flat and it takes off. So Again, another reason why you want to operate between 4 amps. Like even though they say up there 8 amps and 15 amps, all these curves kind of show, but it, you know, if you want to be linear, you want to be down in under the 5 amp range. And here's yet another example of curves. Now, base current across the bottom, collector and emitter voltage cross, you know, going up vertically on the axes, okay? So then each one of these curves is an example of collector current. So the one on the left, uh, four amps, that's what we're going to probably want to do more of, right? We're going to want to be more over here. So that means that our base current can be, say, at 100 milliamps, we're, we're right here. Right down here, 100 milliamps of base current, we got about one volt across our collector to emitter okay so it drops down but then you st have to start putting a lot of base current to get the voltage to put to push it down so this is where you start getting that knee in there you know where so we're probably going to want to op be operating um, around here we're not going to want to be putting um, half an amp through the base okay we're going to stay over here on this end where it's nice and even, okay? 
All right, and then here's the mechanical dimensions. Now, I went through the NPN right here, and I'll just quickly show you the PNP. If you look at these numbers, the gains right there, uh, the gain bandwidth product, four megahertz. And look at this, safe operating area. If we go over here, 35 volts, we come up. See, it's these things are matched really well. And if you look at this, you know, that curve looks, even the capacitances, which is pretty amazing that, that they can match the PNP as well with the NPN. So, and if you look at the curves here on the HFE, same kind of thing. You want to, it kind of says, hey, let's stay away from going above five amps for sure. Let's go from four to five amps, stay up in this area. Same thing over on the right. The curves are very similar. And of course, the mechanical dimensions are going to be the same. All right, now we're going to look at the schematic. And I'm going to walk you through the, show you the transistors on the output, show you the bias network, and how it's a little bit more complex than what I was showing before. But I think what we saw before, hopefully this will make a lot more sense. Let me know in the comments what you think. So, hope hope that made sense and hope that was informative. All right, so this is our 20 watt class A amp fire. Uh, God, this is from a little bit ago. So it's been changed, modified. We got a little higher voltage rails here now. Uh, by this is our voltage rails here on the left, the plus and the minus voltage rail. And here's our feedback. Here, this is our input circuit. This is our feedback circuit to keep it at zero volts on the output. But here's our output. So we have. Uh, two transistors, two NPNs in parallel. Here's the 2.22 ohm resistors. And then we have two more 0.22s going to the PNP transistors. So the MJ15025 is down here. MJ15024 is up here. So this is our output stage. And this guy here, this stage here is a drive stage. Okay. But... The bias network for this drive stage is right here. Okay, it's these things here, along with these two 47K resistors. So really, it's this loop all the way up and down here. Okay, now this 10 mic cap is just to hold this thing steady. Okay, it's just nice, uh, basically from here to here, it's keeping this nice DC voltage. Okay. And LED is really shorted out in this circuit. It always has been. And I'm not sure why. Maybe it's because the LED drifted too much with temperature. And that wasn't a good thing. So this transistor right here provides... This one sits on the heat sink. This will help provide the tracking for these, you know, for the output stage. Okay. And then our potentiometer is right here, this resistor right here, okay? So that's where I set uh, the resistance to get the right voltage across this base to emitter. We start off at 690, so you never go short. You're going to start at least there and go up to as high as 2.7K, basically. So there's a 3.3 there, so kind of divided that up. I mean, you know, and then through the shorted out LED, 47K here and a 47K here. So we got four, two 47Ks with this, essentially, let's call it, you know, 6K of resistance going through here. So we have about 14, 15, 16K from here, down here to down here. And this is Minus 35 volts, and this is about plus 35 volts. All right, so we have enough headroom. So even if we have voltage drop across these transistors, which you know we show in the data sheets, you have to have voltage drop for these, but then these are being driven by this guy. So the emitter of this goes into this. So 
say that from the output, if you track it, you got this 0.22 ohm resistor, an emitter to base, and then through a small resistor here. But then you got another emitter to base to here. And then you have this resistor that has to drop voltage for this circuit. So we need voltage for this and voltage for this guy and and output. So there's a stack up of voltages. That's why you need a high headroom out here. And so when the voltage is sitting kind of high out here and you're putting in a lot of bias current through, you're heating these things up. Okay. Now I guess what we could have had is a staggered power supply where these voltage rails for the two transistors out here are a little bit lower and the ones for this stage was at a different voltage rail. So then that way these guys would, would have a say 30 volts across them instead of 35 maybe. That lowered the overall power dissipation on the output stage when it's idling. And then from the output we go through the Zobo network to the speaker. Okay, so there's our schematic and you can see how we're setting this up. This 10 mic cap again, it's just a DC power supply for this, this network because we just want to hold this voltage as a DC voltage. This is a drive which yanks this whole, this middle part up and down, which, you know, goes out and drives all this stuff. Okay, so this is setting up the bias then this guy's like a whip, whipping it up and down to uh, drive our music. So, and then this one here, the feedback is just trying to keep this guy at zero volts. So it's look at it, well, it's actually just trying to keep the output at zero. So if the output drifts, it forces this guy to change. And this is also a low frequency, 470K times a 0.47 mic. So low frequency and 0.47K across here with the 47 and 10K. So we got a lot of, this is just for DC bias, just to keep this at zero volts. It's coming back here, it's our servo loop. It's saying, whoops, not zero. Okay, let's put it zero. When music starts playing, it can't, this guy can't react fast enough to give any kind of feedback. So uh, at that point, it's, you know, it's, so it's not providing feedback in the, in the typical way. It's just a DC servo loop. So I hope that makes sense. Hey guys, if you made it this far, that's pretty amazing. Uh, let me know in the comments down below what you guys think. I know people will have a lot of ideas and a lot of good ideas. There's a lot of thoughts on, on this kind of stuff. So I'm really interested in, in what you have to say. So uh, hopefully this was helpful. And the next video will be a short video where I actually go through the biasing of this amplifier and we'll check the temperature. And I'd like to know how much current do you think that I should set the bias for? That's going to be a big one. So... Yeah, I'm really curious what you guys think after watching the video. Thanks for watching, and two big thumbs up to all my patrons. Really appreciate you guys. And by the way, there's a thank you button down below. You want to buy me a cup of coffee? It's been a long day. This video actually is taking a while to do. And yeah, I'm sorry it turned out to be so long. <sighs> Sometimes they just work out that way. I actually reshot it a number of times, and every time it just... I, it was just hard to make it shorter. I'm sure I could have, you know, if I redid it again. But anyway, thanks for watching. And hopefully it wasn't too long. And, you know, let me know. <laughs> every once, I've been trying to do shorter videos, but every once in a while we might end up with the long one. Hopefully not this long, but let me know what you guys think. All right, so thanks, and we'll see you next time.